Bienvenidos a todas, todas, todos. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, we are here at the seminario de Instituto de Investigaciones de SADAF y CONESET. Our invited speaker today is Professor Mark Kockelberg. Uh, he's a professor of philosophy of media and technology at the University of Vienna. His research areas are philosophy of technology, including philosophy of artificial intelligence, ethics, epistemology, and philosophical anthropology. And he recently published a book on AI ethics at MIT Press. So today we have a, this seminar, and we are going to hear his conference about AI and the revision of political belief. Thank you very much for coming and all yours. Thank you for your uh, introduction. Uh, th uh, thank you very much. I um, am happy to speak here. I was a uh, long time ago, uh, well, quite some time ago there. And um, now it has to be virtual, but it's great to, um, yeah, to see what you will respond to my uh, talk. I decided to talk about AI and the revision of political beliefs. I thought this might be of interest uh, to you. It's um, a kind of combination of uh, thinking about technology, um, political philosophy, and epistemology. Um, so it might have something in it for, for uh, several members of departments. Um, First, I introduce the question, then I go into the, the, the main uh, issue about revision of beliefs um, in, in the context of uh, problems with AI and democracy, and then I conclude and also make some remarks about policy. So let's first uh, try to get to the main question, because if we're talking about AI, democracy and technology, then we want to know what, what AI um, is and what is meant by AI. So when I will speak about AI today, I refer to machine learning applications using usually large quantities of data. And um, the, the way I came to this problem was because in the media, we saw that uh, in political context, AI has been used for manipulation of elections via social media. I uh, think about the Cambridge Analytica case and also other cases um, in, in uh, North American context. Um, as a philosopher of technology, I'm especially interested in the non-intended influence of AI. So the point is not only that people use AI for certain uh, political reasons, which is quite straightforward, but also that AI has some uh, side effects, some non-intended effects uh, that also are of political significance and consequence. Um, so what are the influences of AI on democracy and what, why are they important, normatively speaking? If we ask this question, we have to look, of course, at another concept uh, next to AI, and that's democracy. And there is a whole uh, history of philosophy that thinks about what democracy is, and there's a lot of contemporary discussion um, of that also in um, political philosophy. Uh, for the purpose of this paper, I distinguish between some thin conceptions of democracy, which uh, have formal requirements such as majority rule, uh, voting in a representative uh, democracy. Well, th this is one way of seeing democracy in the way that we often talk about democracy. But there's also another um, strand in political philosophy that has a more thick, rich conception of democracy, one that uh, rests on the philosophical republicanism, not to be confused with political republicanism, um, philosophical republicanism, which um, uh, is, for example, present in, uh, in Jean-Jacques Rousseau's writings, and uh, later also further in Dewey, uh, where he talks about deliberation and education. Um, there's also thinking about, about uh, deliberation, of course, in more recent times in Habermas and in, in uh, Mouf, who has a more agonistic conception. Uh, so there are all these different um, conceptions of um, democracy that I call more thick or rich because they ask much more of citizens than just going to vote. They ask participation, they ask deliberation, they ask discussion. And uh, if we look at the conditions 
to democracy, uh, I think it gets more interesting because we see, for example, a value like freedom and rule of law is important. You cannot um, at the same time have a dictatorship and put people in prison for political reasons and say that you have a democracy. Uh, there has to be a rule of law, has to be uh, respected. Um, there are also some conditions that are more social. If you have a completely broken society, a society where everyone is isolated, where there's a lot of loneliness, uh, in, in Hannah Arendt's words, then this could also be problematic for democracy. It looks like democracy needs still to rely on something uh, social being there. So the very extreme liberal view that you can just have individuals and then they come together um, to do a contract or to, to talk in a parliament uh, is probably not going to work. You need some, some kind of um, social fabric and community still there. Then also, um, this is important for, for today, is that, that you need some knowledge and education on the part of the citizens. Um, so in this Republican ideals, um, if you are to participate, if you are to discuss, of course, you need to know what you're talking about. You need to um, inform yourself about the issues. Um, for example, in our times, that could be inform yourself about climate change, about uh, the, the uh, pandemic and so on. Uh, because otherwise you, you, you cannot talk about it. So there is a knowledge basis that is required at least for this kind of ideals of democracy that, that are richer than just voting. Another way of putting that in terms of agency is to say that citizens, in order to have political agency, um, they need to, uh, yeah, being allowed to, to freely vote, of course, um, and have all these kind of rule of law conditions in place, but also they, they need a lot of other abilities and freedoms um, and capacities. And this is about being able to reason, discuss, defend your view, being able to make your voice heard also, if we think about more the, the move type of um, theory where it's important that people have a voice, that people are included. Um, so these kind of arguments could be made uh, for, um, for political agency. And for that kind of political agency, then one needs this knowledge basis. Knowledge has been discussed for uh, all of the history of philosophy, again, from Plato onwards. Um, also the, the, the problems of technocracy already in, in some sense. Um, here I'm interested in using the concept of epistemic agency uh, to talk about what kind of knowledge is needed for democracy, for democratic political agency and how this agency um, might be threatened by um, AI. So the general question more precisely is what kind of epistemic agency is needed for democrat democratic political agency in a democracy? What kind of epistemic agency is also needed for exercising one's responsibility as a citizen? That's another way of putting it. Um, I will use political agency mainly. And then the question, how might AI shape that epistemic agency? Um, so why do I use epistemic agency? What is this concept? Um, one definition is the control that agents may exercise over their beliefs. Um, here we're talking then about political beliefs. And this relates to all kinds of questions that uh, people in epistemology have asked about how beliefs are formed. Uh, how we can take responsibility for our beliefs, um, discussions about whether beliefs and of their formation can be seen as voluntary in any sense. How, again, how much control do I have about formation also, not only the exercise of the beliefs, but, uh, um, of exercise of control over the beliefs I have, but also the formation of these beliefs. And um, yeah, it's clear that normatively speaking, um, whatever happens with regard to our beliefs, we, we wish to take an active role with regard to our beliefs and the acquisition of beliefs. We wish to be epistemic agents. Um, so that, that's, that's one thing. And then um, one, could, one could then, starting from epistemology, discuss, of course, as is done in social epistemology, how belief formation is influenced by 
the social dimension, um, for example, how others peers influence our beliefs and what that then means for our normative ideals. Um, I will not go into that here. That's a different topic. I propose to add um, epistemic agency has also a technological dim dimension and it's technology that can also um, make these ideals difficult to realize. Um, because what happens today is that belief formation often takes place via search engines in social media environments, via the use of electronic devices and so on. And so I think we need to analyze and evaluate the epistemic consequences of the use of digital technologies for the epistemic work individuals do within social epistemological and political epistemological environments. So these social problems are still there, or the, you know, the, the social as a problem for this kind of view of epistemic agency. Um, but I focus on the technological side and also on the on the political side and democracy again. So this is like an introduction starting from the epistemology rather than from AI and democracy. Um, my hypothesis, if you wish, is that some degree of epistemic agency seems to be needed for political agency in a democracy, especially in the thick version, because as a citizen, I need to be able to form my own political beliefs and have a sufficient degree of control over them. Um, if someone else controls my beliefs, then what's the point of having, having a democracy? So I need to form my own political beliefs. I also need to be able to um, keep in mind all this participation and deliberation ideals. I need to be capable to detach myself from my beliefs and uh, at least to some extent in order to reflect on them, to question them and uh, discuss them with others uh, so that perhaps I, I could revise them. Um, and this discussion with others is, of course, also very important in these deliberative, rich ideals of democracy. So I, in these discussions, I need to be able also to revise my beliefs if necessary. In any case, I have to be willing to discuss them. I have to accept some kind of vulnerability there um, rather than saying like, no, this is my belief and, and I don't, um, don't move a, a centimeter. Uh, we, we, we go into the discussion as citizens, that's the ideal at least, and we, we uh, reflect on our beliefs together with others, uh, put them on the table to speak in a, in a, in a vulnerable way. Um, so then my question is like, okay, if this is our ideal, then is the development and exercise of these forms of political epistemic agency, these forms of democratic agency in a full sense, is it possible under conditions shaped by the use of AI and other digital technologies and social media platforms today? And the thesis of this paper is that AI may influence belief formation, belief revision, and the acknowledgement of epistemic vulnerability in ways that render the exercise of these forms of epistemic agency needed for political agency in a democracy at least more difficult. So I'm not saying it's impossible um, to do all these things in a democracy with AI, but AI may endanger democracy by making uh, belief formation and um, uh, belief revision more difficult and hence, um, yeah, uh, threaten this kind of um, epistemic agency needed for democratic political agency. So let me go into detail now why I think that the formation and revision of political beliefs is problematic um, in a democracy when uh, AI is used in various ways. So how exactly may AI influence the formation and revision of our political beliefs and how may it make acknowledging their vulnerability in the light of political deliberation more difficult? I see at least three problems. One is the phenomenon of direct intended manipulation of beliefs, for example, politicians using social media to manipulate. Um, and another one is indirect effects. And there I distinguish between uh, the kind of knowledge offered and defaulted by AI and the creation and maintenance of epistemic bubbles, a phenomenon that has already been described, but which I reframe uh, in the light of um, you know, using the lens of 
epistemic agency. So let me go into each of these um, for a moment. The first one is manipulation of political beliefs. So social media campaigns based on analysis of data by means of AI and data science um, can manipulate political beliefs. For example, the Cambridge Analytica case in the presidential campaign of Donald Trump um, used data of 50 million Facebook users, harvested these data without their consent, and, and these were used for micro-targeting, which is a form of advertising um, where you customize messages based on people's personality profile extracted from the data on these various digital platforms. And um, I will use an example of someone who, um, who tries to uh, form and change her political beliefs, but is targeted by, in this case, by political advertising. So here, the person I will talk about, uh, Claire, is targeted by pro-Trump political advertising. And then the question is, what does that do with her beliefs? Well, she is targeted to change her political beliefs. So it could be that if she has the beliefs that, um, in this case, Trump, uh, if she her beliefs agree with Trump, then she will be confirmed in her political beliefs by the, the micro-targeting and manipulation. Or if she doesn't, she, um, people might try to change her political beliefs. In both cases, it looks like this is a problem for um, epistemic political agency because um, what is done here is that the epistemic architecture um, of users is changed without their consent. And I would like to compare that with um, nudging where uh, you have the choice architecture that's changed well, here the epistemic architecture, the beliefs architecture is changed um, by means of manipulation. And this diminishes, of course, epistemic agency because you don't have control over your beliefs anymore if you are uh, under the radar, under the radar of your um, consciousness and your, your control are manipulated. And I think that's a problem because uh, the political agency where you have control over your beliefs and their revision is the kind of political agency required in a thick kind of democracy in which citizens form their own beliefs in open and public communication and deliberation and manipulation violates that autonomy. Uh, just like nudging, it works uh, against our autonomy and control and therefore maintains, um, uh, sorry, works against maintaining a more public de deliberative dimension of democracy. So my fear is here that Claire's political and epistemic agency is reduced as she's manipulated to change her beliefs or is confirmed in her existing beliefs, uh, even if she wants to change them without her knowledge and consent. And this violates the requirements of democratic um, citizenship. A second way that AI may influence a belief revision is through statistical knowledge and um, in particular defaulting statistical knowledge. Um, so suppose Claire is raised in a racist community and comes to believe that people with a white skin are superior to others, but later learns that there's no scientific evidence for this belief. My question then is, will she be able to exercise epistemic agency and change her belief? That is, in this case, drop the white supremacist belief, or at least not use it in future deliberations. Well, I think we can um, uh, adapt now the thought experiment for technological influence in such a way that Claire is indeed uh, like, you know, that there is indeed this, this uh, danger that um, that she won't change her belief here because statistical information um, could, for example, give a correlation between uh, a certain skin color, white here, and success in her particular society, say the US. And um, well, if she just takes that um, statistical information, if this and, and if this statistical information is defaulted all the time, um, by means of AI algorithms, um, that will be harder for her to change her belief. 
So I don't claim again that it's impossible to do so, but there is this technological influence. Um, so changing beliefs becomes more difficult when the statistical knowledge is defaulted um, rather than causal scientific knowledge, um, which would undermine her belief, uh, of course. And um, given the political nature and the political relevance of these beliefs, I think these difficulties for epistemic agency um, caused by AI um, really endanger also political agency, the political agency of this particular person and of so many other citizens in that context. I think in a democracy, especially one of the thick kind, it's necessary that people are able to change their views in the light of scientific evidence. And clearly here, there's an influence of AI um, that goes in the other direction. Then the third uh, phenomenon is epistemic bubbles and related phenomena. Um, epistemic bubbles have, has been defined as a social epistemic structure in which other relevant voices have been left out, perhaps accidentally. An echo chamber is a related phenomenon uh, in which social epistemic structure, uh, again, means that voices have been excluded. Um, I don't care so much about the specific difference here between echo chambers and epistemic bubbles. The point is that um, there is exclusion of voices, there is distrust of outside sources, and um, I think this is a problem, not only a problem um, in general, but also a problem for epistemic agency. So if we look at the thought experiment, um, we could take again Claire's example. Uh, Claire, who hears in her community mainly white supremacist echoes in the epistemic bubble of her social media community. So AI is here used, usually used in that social media environments. These are used in a particular community and there she encounters these beliefs uh, over and over again. And I think it will be harder for her to exercise her epistemic agency and potentially change her beliefs since she's not sufficiently exposed to opposing views. Um, and in addition, will also probably distrust other views. So this is not only a problem uh, regarding diversity of views, which again generally is a problem politically in itself, but also is um, yeah creating social epistemic structures that uh, encourage people to maintain rather than question, reflect on, and revise their political beliefs. Therefore, um, political agency in a democracy is endangered. Another way of saying is, uh, is that epistemic bubbles and echo chambers dimin diminish citizens' capacity to render um, their uh, beliefs vulnerable, for example, in discussions uh, among citizens, thinking again about this kind of participative, uh, deliberative model of democracy. And um, it will instead enable citizens to feel very confident about the beliefs they already have it will discourage revising them in the light of opposing views or indeed, as I argued before, in the light of scientific evidence. So political agency, democratic agency reduced, and um, this is all non-intended effects usually. Um, sometimes it's also intended, but usually it's non-intended. So we just use these technologies, um, AI and social media, think that they're just instruments but at the same time are exposed to this phenomena um, and have our um, epistemic and therefore uh, yeah, epistemic architecture and therefore political epistemic agency uh, influenced. To conclude, what can we conclude from that? Um, I think, first of all, it's very interesting to, to engage in this kind of what I call political epistemology of AI. I think it's good to connect this with discussions in epistemology and political philosophy. Um, and I think we, by doing that, by looking at the matter through the lens of epistemic agency, um, I think I've been able to ask an interesting question, a question that instead of asking in general how AI influences democracy, enabled me to ask a very specific question that goes into the um, yeah the knowledge basis uh, of of uh, uh, political agency and democracies 
and um, yeah, I've, I've asked what is, what kind of epistemic agency is needed and how might AI shape that. Um, I've answered that some degrees of some forms of epistemic agency are indeed needed for political agency in a democracy. I need to be freely for my beliefs. I need to reflect on my political beliefs. I need to openly discuss them, deliberate with others about them, and if necessary, revise them. And in any case for all this, that expose them to the, um, to the to the discussion. So if that's true, if that is all needed for political agency in a democracy, then it seems to me that based on the phenomena that we see, that the exercise of such forms of epistemic agency are rendered more difficult, if not endangered, by AI-supported intended manipulation of political beliefs, the unintended defaulting of statistical knowledge as opposed to causal knowledge, and finally, the usually unintended, not always, but usually unintended creation and maintenance of epistemic bubbles and related phenomena, which discourage rendering my beliefs vulnerable to discussion and revision, um, and which encourage me to distrust others. I think the implications for research is that um, if that's the sort of tentative conclusion is that much more research is needed because there needs to be more um, linked to empirical work on this. There, um, that's one direction one could go. There needs to be a further development of the arguments. Um, we can do that in, in different ways. Um, but in any case, what we can conclude is that um, if the dangers in, identified and analyzed in this paper are real, and if we want to strengthen democracy, uh, because of course all this is not valid when when we um, want auto authoritarianism, but um, if we want democracy, which I hope we we want, then I believe policy um, should propose and implement interventions in the political epistemic landscape that strengthen people's agency. This can be done by furthering research I talk about. It can also be done by enabling and encouraging um, citizens to educate themselves better, uh, to get educated better. Um, I think this open and public deliberation only works on the basis of education and requires then also the right kind of political and educational institutions. So if something is wrong with the way you organize education in your society, you won't get the citizens you want for uh, this thick kind of democracy. You can do a thin kind of democracy, you can let people vote um uh, there are various places that call themselves democracies where people vote but to if we want a more thick kind of democracy we need more and then so we need that to build that epistemic basis uh through education i believe this is also in the spirit of of dewey and and russo uh finally i think when it comes to policy uh with regard to regulation i think we can regulate or even ban some uses of ai um, it's not so easy to, to say we ban it because I think um, AI and data science do, do a lot of good things also in the political sphere. They can also help us to inform, to be informed. Um, they can help uh, science, for example, climate science and so on. Um, however, we need to um, regulate or ban uses, particular uses um, that may contribute to the manipulation of beliefs the uncritical defaulting of statistical knowledge and the creation of epistemic bubbles. And I think this require, requires um, not just um, uh, having, uh, having a law against some use of AI, but in fact um, requires um, some changes to the rest of our society in the end. It requires demanding and stimulating changes to all kinds of technological epistemic processes. For example, we can also intervene in the R&D, in the research and development um, in companies. Um, they can also take themselves initiatives for that. Um, I think we really need also organizational changes for this to happen, because otherwise we will just uh, stick to doing uh, the same uh, things with regard to knowledge, what we usually do. Um, so I think these are some, some suggestions what can be done to strengthen the epistemic basis uh, for democracy uh, with, you know, in, in view of the arguments regarding epistemic agency and democracy uh, that I made. 
And uh, again, this is in the spirit of people like Dewey and, Dewey and Rousseau. Dewey famously said that democracy is more than a form of government that is primarily a mode of associated living, living of conjoint communicated experience. I think this quote suggests us to, you know, one research route to, to further explore is the, the connection between knowledge and uh, political knowledge we talked about and yeah, the, the, the more the, the communicational um, and, and social context of, um, of what is happening here, like what is, what is really needed in a society uh, to make all this work, to make this democratic agency work. And um, yeah, we really need to develop what I call political technologies. Also in my book, the, the political philosophy of AI, we need political technologies that enable rather than hinder um, such forms of living and such experiences, um, not only because they are valuable in themselves, we need better ways of associated living indeed, but we, we also need it for democracy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for the talk, the wonderful talk. Probably we have, I think, question to ask to you. I don't know if someone, Eduardo, raise his hand. Thank you. Uh, uh, may I ask something? Or? Yes, of course, adelante. Okay, yes. okay because I, I don't see anything. <laughs> Yeah, ah, I, we can stop sharing the screen, maybe, Mark yeah. or Lucio. Ah, okay. I I thought I did, but maybe not. Okay, let me check. Uh, the, ah, okay. now I have the right kind of screen. Ah, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you That's much very better. much for your talk. Um, <clears throat> just a very general worry. Um, I wonder whether we are not idealizing a little bit the previous situation, the situation before the existence of <clears throat> artificial intelligence, because all of these phenomena you mentioned in your mm -hmm. talk already existed before manipulation, yep. systemic models, and so on. People got self confirming their beliefs and so on. So, in order to say that uh, artificial intelligence is a danger for democracy, we should make some kind of comparison between the situation before mm. and after the, the existence of, of this uh, technology. And um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how uh, we can do this kind of comparison or, or this, because it's already true that uh, this technology and algorithm and yeah, artificial intelligence may have also some benefits for democracy. So we have to balance both things. And uh, but I'm I'm not sure where, whether you are. Uh, yeah, yeah. Good, good questions. Um, thank you for the. I I, uh, I agree with you. I mean, uh, so uh, we already have this problem. So my my. The, the the general claim behind this is that that AI um, doesn't do this on its own, but that it makes existing problems worse, right? Yes. Um, but that could be taken as an empirical claim, and then research is needed to show what exactly is the difference today, if there's really a, a big difference or not. Um, so what, what I've presented is the sort of conceptual work for it, but I think we could then look into the, the details and see how, how much difference there is with the previous situation. Um, mm -hmm. I also think that the tech can have some benefits. It's a separate project, but one could try to use the AI for, for democracy, in, you know, to, to support democracy. Um, I did mention it briefly that, that there can also be uh, good things about AI, right? So I don't want to have like a, a merely negative story here. Um, I, whether that's then a question of balancing, maybe it's not balancing, but rather that we really have to um, to stimulate certain kinds of users of AI, right? And 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 other users, we have to um, try to 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 decourage. So that's that's the kind of thing what policy needs to do then. 
to um, yeah to make sure that that the benefits indeed outweigh the the problems. Thank you. Uh, Federico. Hi, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Mark. Uh, well, my first question was already asked by Eduardo, and I think he's right about that these are not problems specific for of artificial intelligence, uh, but are permanent to modern democracies, I mean. But I have a more broad question about the importance of epistemic agency to justify democracy or for political agency. Mm. Uh, I think this is an empirical issue, but maybe epistemic agency is a fiction. So people are not able to revise and improve their beliefs, uh, regardless of uh, artificial intelligence. It's, I don't know, maybe that's a, a fact, an empirical fact. So mm. I think we will still defend the democracy as the right mm. political order uh, yeah. because it's the only political order that imposes coercion through a right process, the right procedure, the right moral procedure. So maybe if your idea is that the epistemic agency is important to a particular version of democracy, a fake version that you call it, mm. and we can reject that version because it's unrealistic, maybe we can doubt about the requirement of the epistemic agency that you propose. Good points, yeah. So I, I think there are two things here, right? So um, first of all, the, the last thing that you said, of course, we can reject the thick or rich version, right? So so if you don't agree with me that this we need this more uh, deliberative and, and, and participative ideal, then, then we're ready because then we don't need so much epistemic agency, although we might still need some small degree of epistemic agency. Uh, for example, that people, when they vote, that they have some information about the parties they vote to, right? But, but this degree is important, I think. So that takes me to what you first said, how important is epistemic agency for democracy? Is epistemic agency a fiction? I think the ideal is a fiction if, uh, if we, um, if we think that we have like always 100% control of our beliefs. So the, the, the modern ideal of autonomy and control is, is exaggerated, right? We, empirically speaking, we don't have that control. And it might even be that normatively, we don't want that. I mean, there could be benefits of not always be completely in control of, of um, all kinds of things. So that's the ideal. And then also like, yeah, um, I think it's a matter of degree. So I think for for this richer ideal, I think maybe you need a higher degree than for the the, the thin ideal. Um, but but how much depends how much you you know like how much democracy do you want? It could be that um, that there is a kind of trade off with other val political values, right? We will, we don't want to uh, spend every day from morning to evening discussing democratic issues at every level of our society. We might also need experts, for example. So democracy is also, should also not be probably normatively speaking an absolute ideal and, and not this real. So, so I think we, yeah, I, I think needs to be qualified probably my, my claim, right? So that, that um, epistemic agency, that some degree of epistemic agency is needed. And what I always said, like, if you, you know, take on board this rich version, if you don't, then then much less is needed. Thank you. So good, good questions. Okay, we have another one, uh, Liana. Yes, thank you very much for your, for your talk. Very interesting. Um, I I think that something that it didn't happen before is that uh, we couldn't we, we weren't able to gather um, that much information over individuals. So that's something that is uh, quite new and that's something which uh, uh, AI has something to do. Um, I was wondering if you think that um, in order to regulate that, uh, we can develop like um, special, uh, I don't know, law, laws of devices um, 
um, pointing uh, specifically the, the way in which corporations or even states gather information about people. Uh, yeah. Because I think that's something important. Yeah, um, I think the, the question of power here is important, right? And, and, and how exactly it happens. Yeah, so, so there's, there's I, I focused on the, in a way, the epistemic and then in the end, the political effects of what's happening. But the, um, the way it's done could also be a, a ethically problematic, right? So that, that you don't ask consent. Um, and moreover, we don't. We are not in an equal power relation with with these corporations. Um, they can they can uh, do a, do a lot, and we we click yes because we we need to use the services in a in a contemporary society and work, for example. So so I think the question whether we can have that kind of democracy should probably also include next to these questions of epistemic agency, these kind of questions. So I did not, not uh, pretend to, to talk about the whole, like all the problems here, um, but I do think that's, uh, that's an important side of, of things. Um, I'm especially interested there in this kind of power asymmetries. Um, and that also relates a bit to the previous question, of course, because this epistemic agency gets quite fictional once we see the huge influence of all the, um, yeah, the, 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 the programs and platforms that we use that are managed by these corporations. And so much decisions about our epistemic lives are already taken by them. Like how everything is structured, the whole ar architecture. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank, thank you. We have another question, Federico. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for your talk. Very interesting. Uh, I have a question because <clears throat> I can understand how um, artificial intelligence can improve the formation of epistemic bubbles as a form of damaging epistemic agency. But I would like to, to know a little more about how uh, artificial intelligence can have an, as a non-intended um, effect uh, the development of uh, echo chambers, because mm -hmm. um, uh, I think that uh, the members of echo chambers can be seen as developing an intense epistemic activity. They are not so passive as the members of a, uh, uh. epistemic bubble. So they can be seen as, in a sense, as not, not having uh, agency but that's having a, a, a deviation of the agency of epistemic agents. So I would like to know more, a little more about how this kind of uh, mm -hmm. epistemic uh, uh, problem is uh, improved by uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that, that would be interesting to look at that specifically. So, so you're suggesting that they actually do have some agency in echo chambers still, right? Um, I, I would then ask the question, who really has the agency there? So I do think that someone like Steve Bannon, for example, or, or some people that are leaders of, uh, say, extreme right uh, organizations, they, they have a lot of epistemic agency uh, they, for themselves and also in influencing the beliefs of others. But I do think that, that, that maybe most members of these echo chambers that they, um, they, they actively exclude other voices, but they don't have epistemic agency in the sense that, that they, they uh, are not encouraged by others and are not themselves uh, questioning their beliefs. And, uh, so, and the, the people that do have the epistemic agency and leadership, they kind of create this environment for them so that these beliefs are reinforced and that they distrust others like in this case for example people from the left so um yeah I, I, i'm happy to make the distinction if we can then uh show that there is a the difference but i think in in that case ai can also again um yeah uh, reinforce that and, and help uh in this case more authoritarian people and and help to 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 re to keep the echo chamber 
there. And it's not only AI, but of course also social media and whatever other digital technologies that create this environment. Um, so it's it's people plus a technology. And um, yeah, in, in the case of echo chambers, there could be a, a bit of inten intended effect, right? But that intended effect is done only only some, and the, I would say the majority are having the the effect that they at least didn't intend, but that maybe others intended for them. So again, a kind of power political question. Thank you. Thank you. Camilo, uh, Camilo has another question. Thank you for the presentation. I was thinking about the comment made by Eduardo. Uh, so I heard a, a couple of times this idea that, uh, OK, uh, the bad effects of AI were already present before. So mm -hmm. it is not clear uh, whether AI is particularly bad. But I'm not sure whether this is or not uh, relevant for your uh, project. So mm -hmm. uh, it may depend on what your motivation is. So maybe your motivation is to show that AI has some intrinsic bad uh, consequences that were not present before. And, or maybe your thesis is that AI is particularly bad. It, uh, it potentiates some bad effects. And then you, may, you should make the comparison, right? Uh, but if the whole motivation, I mean, that comparison, I don't know if, uh, if this is the more interesting philosophical project for me, it, uh, or in my opinion. Uh, maybe the more interesting thing is to motivate uh, the idea that we should regulate uh, AI, the uses of AI. And for this, I do not see how it is so relevant to make a comparison with the previous, uh, with the previous situation. It right. also needs to show that AI is, has bad effects, and that's it. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Uh, so, so then uh, I could make for, for that only I could make a weaker claim that it has the bad effects that I described, but I don't have to say that that it's AI as opposed to other things that are particularly bad. That's true. Um, Yeah, I, I I agree with you. So um, so I can I can uh, one way of dealing with it is saying more work is necessary for the strong claim. But if I make a big weaker claim, then um, then that's enough for for sure for the regulation. But I think also for the conclusions that I made that that like if these conditions are you know and these phenomena are happening, then we have these problems for these and these reasons. Based on the conceptual analysis, so I can I can still say that um, without um, implying that that AI is sort of the, the evil thing. Yeah, it's anyway the, the the complexity is 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 that it's never technology by itself. So it's all, always like what people do, what um, the, the particular context. Um, in, a, in a particular political culture, certain things are possible that are not possible in other political cultures. Um, so how exactly epistemic agency is allowed to develop or is hindered has also to do with the social environment. So I think these social epistemological problems also um, are relevant there. Okay, we have a, one more question, Santiago. Hi, thanks for the, for the talk, really interesting. I wanted to pick up on something Federico said a few minutes ago. I understood your notion of epistemic agency to be descriptive. Some agents do more in order to get information, some agents do less, some are more active, some are more passive. Mm. However, in your reply, I understood <clears throat> that there's People in echo chambers have the wrong kind of epistemic agency. They they search for information. They are active in searching for information, but they find out they find out the wrong kind of things. So it seems like the, the idea of epistemic agency is a normative notion, not a purely descriptive notion notion of what uh, individuals do. And I was wondering if we maybe we need a a, a stronger 
normative notion of epistemic agency in order to uh, make this account work. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think, do they have the wrong kind of epistemic agency? So yes, if you just define epistemic agency as doing something about your knowledge or something, but if it, if I defined epistemic agency in terms of like relief, um, belief revision, uh, and I'm willing to discuss it, putting your beliefs vulnerable and so on. So then, uh, so so these members, uh, say the regular members of the echo chambers, they don't have that kind of epistemic agency. They're epistemically active, but it's not a proper kind of agency to just look for confirmation of your beliefs with you know without willing being willing to discuss them um and and ai is uh, furthering that kind of agency but it's not yeah it's not the kind of epistemic agency that i talked about well i also have a question and my question is about journalism the fourth power in in a democracy or a public yeah. Uh, because um, at some point that was the place where we could look for news in order to, sh to change our beliefs, our political beliefs and all our other beliefs, but mainly political beliefs. But nowadays people don't read newspapers nor watch TV or radio under 35, no one does. And mm -hmm. those who are older like me, <laughs> who still look to yeah. the web, web pages of journals, uh, we are also manipulated as I acknowledged recently because some newspapers also use algorithms in order to show me what I yeah. want to read. <laughs> so I think that's a place where probably some kind of regulation should work. I don't know what you think about that yeah. point. I, I totally agree with you. So in order to have enough epistemic diversity and to have this kind of uh, place that you describe it's uh, journalism uh, we need really quality journalism and we need journalism that's not a matter of algorithms but of people selecting information that that is not there yet right um and and so um we definitely need to protect if there are still people doing that we need to protect that and make sure that that it kind of gets to a wider audience too um, so it's definitely also a media problem, um, social media that, that really yeah, work against that kind of journalism. Um, on the other hand, it's not completely, um, you know, binary because in social media, for example, when I use social media, I'm going to look for posts of quality newspapers to inform myself. Um, but of course, that presupposes that I'm educated, that I already have been exposed to other kind of sources and so on. So yeah, it's it's um, it's it's complicated. It's not like social media are completely bad, and uh, but um, but I think we we probably need a mix of what people use now, like social media with the help of AI, online newspapers, and some. Yeah, some kind of journalism and media that um, that directly strengthen the epistemic agency I talked about. Uh, so next to education, you're right. I should have mentioned also for sure, uh, like high quality journalism. And it's so important in a in a democracy. Okay, I don't see more hands raised. I don't know if someone has another question. Ah, Diego. Uh, we we cannot hear you. No, we cannot hear you, Dio. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Mark, for your talk. Just as a matter of curiosity, I would like to know if the, in the European Union now there are some discussion about in which specific cases uh, the prohibition or even the ban of regulation of uses of artificial intelligence and data science should happen. No? 
I would like to know those cases and what do you have in mind about those cases? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the, the European Commission wants to make this uh, the regulation now, and uh, it's about um, ethics of AI mainly with uh, things like, like bias and, um, um, and, and, and all kind of problems like that. What, what I miss a little bit is this kind of uh, discussion about the political dimensions. So as far as I know, know there is not really um, much regulation for, proposed for that. Uh, but it will be interesting to see what's now going to happen, what the actual regulation will be. There was, there was a strategy, there was a proposal for regulation. Um, I, yeah, I, I think it's not very specific about this, these political phenomena. Um, so maybe some more attention is, is needed for that. Um, and I'm curious to also to know what's going to happen now. So basically the high level expert group of which I was part has been dissolved and it's all now about the, you know, the, the role politics of uh, negotiation and lobbying and all that. Uh, so I, I don't have um, very much insight in what's happening right now, uh, but it will, I think it will be soon become clear what a, the actual uh, regulation will say. Thank you. Well, is there any other question to Mark? Or... So we just thank Mark for the talk and thank, thank you, you for being here next time in Buenos Aires. I hope so. I hope to okay. meet all of you in person.